Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 156. And I love how Maya Angelou always talked about if we knew better, we'd do better. Because that's what humans do. We learn and then we apply it and we grow and everybody gets blessed. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's Firestarter is Diana Zahir. Diana is a past Firestarter who was featured on podcast episode 146. As you remember, she's a veteran homeschooling mother of two and works with others on healing. Her family has worked and lived all over the world, and she has also studied with other top natural healers as well. Diana, welcome back to The Luminous Mind. Thank you so much. Hey, it's so fun to have you back. When we left our conversation last time, Diana and I decided that we were going to meet again and spend a majority of our time discussing what she calls one of her favorite healing rooms, which is the critical voice. And we kind of felt like, you know, with homeschooling parents in particular, that we may, we may, I'm going to preface that struggle (laughs) with this more than others and hopefully we can give Mm -hmm. some tools for that Um, maybe you give your two cents of why you feel like as homeschooling parents we might struggle with that more I'd be happy to do that and thank you for having me back today I think I can share as a homeschooling parent myself that this is a ripe area for us to feel negatively towards ourselves sometimes or to feel deficient or to feel like we don't know what to do and wonder if we're doing it right. So all of those questions, all of that commentary is the territory of the critical voice. So to understand this part of our minds can help each and every one of us. And it's been a huge part of what I've done in my own inner journey and what I do with my clients. So I think it's a natural place for us to begin today to help homeschooling parents learn to appreciate themselves and to be kind to themselves and to allow a little more space when they wonder, am I doing it right? Do I need some more help? What would feel good for me right now? Uh, Let's kind of first start out with what is the critical voice and why do you think this is your favorite healing room? Sure. So the critical voice is actually a mental structure that we all have. And we're not even aware of the fact that it's a mental structure. We become so accustomed to hearing this energy come toward us where there's doubt or there's criticism or we compare ourselves with someone else or we judge ourselves. I should be this way. I shouldn't be that way. This person is this. This person is that. Whenever we hear a message like that toward ourselves, we know our critical voice is operating in our minds. That doesn't mean we're bad, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us, it just means it's part of the human experience that we can learn to understand and get space from. Because when there's a little space from that voice, we experience ourselves differently. Well, and why do you think that this is your favorite healing room? I would think, you know, kind of the negative side of the critical <laughs> might, might be a reason why I would steer clear of it. But tell us that's why that's right. your favorite. That's right. Actually, <laughs> for this round of healing rooms that are on my web page, it was the last room that I created. And I kept thinking, that's so interesting. What is that? All the other rooms have kind of come together so easily. And I realized it was the last room for me because it was such an important room. And I love this teaching so much because it is a universal experience until we get space from it. If you or I were to go down to the mall near our house and we had a little machine and we could listen inside people's heads, pretty much every single person in that mall would be giving themselves a hard time in one way or another. We all give ourselves a hard time. 
And so to learn to teach people that this isn't who they really are, that this is like a stop along the way to knowing yourself, it just makes my heart so happy and my mind so happy to know that I can help people get space from something that's actually temporary, but we believe it to be true. That is true. So, I mean, and sometimes uh, when we hear ourselves say things, and we can be our own worst enemy of stopping ourselves from doing something that yes. maybe we feel inspired to do, but yet we don't feel competent to do. Does that make sense? And Absolutely. So yes. You, so we, you, we get in our way all the time. Yeah. So you said that, you know, everyone has this critical voice, but, you know, is it necessary? And we hear a lot about having positive thoughts and those types of things, but is it necessary to have a critical voice? That's a great question. It was necessary. It's actually an important part of our development as humans on this planet. When we were very little and maybe two or three years old, maybe even younger, and we were learning how to be in this environment to understand what's dangerous, what's safe. And we had caregivers, whether we call it our conscience or conscientiousness, there was a place and a time for this relationship with ourselves. You know, you think about the stories where little children run out in the street and the parents or the babysitter freak out because mm -hmm. they're so worried the child's going to get hit by a car. And the voice gets really loud and they get really intimidated. You shouldn't run out in the street. So that level of intervention, that level of don't do that, you're not okay, that matches the situation and it matches what's going on with us in our development. Or, you know, I've spent a lot of time in India in the last decade and children are in the kitchen and they tend to have gas stoves and they're big flames and there are a lot of women in the kitchen cooking together. And so little children invariably try to reach up and touch the oven and all the ladies freak out and don't touch the stove, you <laughs> shouldn't do that. So again, it's the should, shouldn't, all of these things. But it matches the situation because they're trying to teach young children to be safe. They're teaching us about danger, teaching us about physical harm. But pretty much after that time in our lives, we don't need this level of urgency. We don't need this level of protection. But because it becomes a part of our growing up time, we take it to be a necessity for living on the planet and for operating ourselves. Well, it does sound like there's a difference between a critical voice and like your conscious working, you know, if, if you are really in a situation of danger, you know, if you're walking on a street and all of a sudden you're sensing something's wrong, you know, maybe that is like a prompting for you to make yourself safe. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Versus, oh, sure. And so it is, I mean, we, we need to separate those two, correct? Critical well, we to. do. I mean, I think it begins that way. We absorb the critical voice from the environment that we grow up in. And initially, these adults are trying to keep us safe. And so comments like, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, they make a lot of sense for safety concerns. But when we start growing up and we live our life, but we have that same level of you should or you shouldn't, and that intensity is there, we realize that Maybe there are other ways we can be with ourselves that won't cause us so much discomfort inside. That's and true. so we start to appreciate this voice because we have to make friends with what's inside us before it's willing to loosen up. And then when we have other tools and our consciousness sees that those tools work better, these older ways they soften and they kind of shift to the background. But until we have those other options, the critical voice will stay in the driver's seat and help us do our day. Well, and maybe that's why, like as homeschooling parents, especially when you're first beginning, you hear that critical voice a lot. Yeah. You shouldn't do this because it's something that you're hearing, but yet you're feeling driven to move that way. So you're kind of having to go against, you know, what your mind is telling you from what your heart is telling you kind of thing. And then maybe as you mm -hmm. travel down that road a little bit and you see, well, this was a good thing for these particular reasons, you're able to quiet that a little better. Is that kind of what you're thinking with a homeschooling parent? Well, 
I think this is such an area where the homeschooling parent comes face to face with this voice because this voice comes up in all of us when we're afraid or we don't know what to do or we're confused or we're overwhelmed because the other parts of us, they aren't responding as quickly as the critical voice, right? A, a homeschooling parent, especially in the beginning, this is such a new journey and it's such a responsibility to be the one who is guiding our children and making decisions for our children and experimenting with all these different things or not. So we're gonna have not knowing, we're gonna have some fear, we're gonna have some overwhelm. And then the critical voice might wanna rush in and say, oh, don't worry, I'm here, I'll help you. Yeah. Because that's a way we know how to feel ordered and structured. It may really hurt, it may feel like a frying pan over the head, but we're not alone. So we're learning how to appreciate what's under the critical voice. Like if I believe, you know, often critical voice will come in and judge even our decision to be a homeschooling parent because people in conventional schooling environments may not understand or our family may not understand. So I may even have a judgment that there's something wrong with me for wanting to homeschool my kids. Yeah. So if we start to look at what is underneath, what is the message that I'm having some judgment about? Perhaps people in my family don't agree with my decision to homeschool my children. And I may hear external judgment from people, which triggers my own internalized judgment or doubt. But if I go under that, if I appreciate, first of all, oh, okay, there's a critical voice judgment. I'm not going to judge myself for judging myself. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing Here's a judgment. I am feeling uncomfortable here. And then I go underneath it. I start to be curious and warm hearted toward myself. Okay, well, I'm hearing this judgment outside of me and it's triggering a judgment inside of me. And I'm noticing that. I'm just aware of it. And if I go under that a little more deeply, what I may discover is I have feelings in there or I have thoughts in there, and I might discover, you know, this is actually really important to me to homeschool my kids. I have to go to sleep with myself at night, and I have to wake <laughs> up with myself in the morning. And if I know that I feel peaceful in my heart making this choice, even though sometimes I'm scared or I don't know what to do, that's more intimate. That's a more direct relationship with myself than the judgment. Yeah. Well, I really love, I love words and antonyms and um, synonyms and those types of things. And it sounds to me like you're acknowledging the fear that you have, maybe that you have the faith that where you're moving in this direction, because I'm thinking of fear and faith are, are um, mm -hmm. antonyms, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you feel like this is the direction I need to go, but then you need to acknowledge that you're scared, that you're, you know, you're fearful, that you have some of those opposite feelings of what you mm -hmm. should be feeling just because of kind of what we've been programmed to think of, you know, of being safe, you know, that this mm -hmm. is kind of moving away from the normal society safeties, right? Is mm -hmm. that, is that kind of what the... Of course. I mean, we have to feel all of the things that are in there together. So there may be fear in moments, there may be faith in other moments. I think when we bring it down into the level of what's happening in our bodies, what's happening on a sensory level, and it's not only the mental level, the mental level is very important, but sometimes judgment can keep us just in our heads with that spinning hamster wheel. When we go into our body and I start feeling in my heart just the warmth and sincerity of homeschooling my kids. and Maybe there's this feeling of love for one of my children. Like, I know this child needs this. And when I let myself go into that and feel the truth of that, I can contact a certain specific energy that arises in me that may feel like a aliveness, may feel like warmth, that may feel like strength. So we start following this thread and see where it leads us. 
Well, it sounds like when we follow that thread, um, it really takes us to thinking it through. Like sometimes when we ignore the feeling that we have and we don't discover it and feel it, that maybe we're not allowing ourselves to kind of broaden our horizons and our thinking and understand really the why behind things. Is that kind yes. of what the... Yes, I think the why and also how. Like say I discover one of my children has this specific need and I can't get it met in a conventional schooling environment. And when I really let myself sink into this apart from any critical voice that's there and I feel the love for this child, I feel the aliveness in it, I just feel this direct knowing that I'm in the right place with my intention. But I may not know how to do it. And that might bring up more fear and I might feel alone again. So it's just like all these layers where the critical voice can come in again, like, well, you don't know what to do, so you're not really qualified, and there's more judgment. It's like, okay, there's my critical voice again. So there's such a power in acknowledging when we notice it's arrived on the scene. That's not the end of the story. That's like just scratching the surface. Like, ooh, my critical voice is here, so there must be something juicy and dirty, right? (laughs) So if I go in there and I notice, well... I can recognize this fact and this why, but I may not have the how. So maybe involved in the how is the fact that I might need some support and I don't know how to get that. And again, going into our bodies, feeling what it's like to give ourselves permission to notice, I don't know what to do here. I know this is important and my heart is really with it but I don't know how. So then more space can come, courage can come. We may talk to other people, we may learn about other resources, we may just get really still and then guidance comes. So it's like without the critical voice running the show and holding us tight, things loosen up and begin to move around. Yeah. Well, and if we don't, um, I mean, if we just shut it down at like, oh, I can't do that, Instead of exploring, why do I feel this way? You know, and like you said, really feeling out the the feelings that you have in your body of like, well, I don't know where the resources are. And so then mm-hmm. you can work through that thread. Like you said, if you just keep following the thread, it yes. seems like you can come up with the solutions better when we follow those threads versus just shutting it down at the fear level. Correct. That's right. It's like these little tugs. We start noticing these little tugs these little threads in the tapestry. It's like, oh, wow, there's something there for me. I'm curious about that. (laughs) Let me see where that takes me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about a little bit about how we quiet that critical voice. I mean, even though we want to acknowledge it, it's still there just, you know, eating at the back of our mind. How can we quiet that and move with it a little, I guess, you know, fluctuate with it better, kind of (laughs) how I describe it. Yeah, exactly. It's like a swimming with it or something. Well, I think the first and simplest job that we have is to notice it's here. Because it happens so quickly and it's so unconscious. And before we know it, we're like engaged with the story that it brought up in our mind. So the fact that I even am wondering, hey, is that my critical voice right now? And I tell my clients in the beginning, because I know this sounds a little strange to talk about voices and all of this. We're really, (laughs) we're not being crazy. But I'll say, you know, make me the weird one. Just imagine I'm with you on your shoulder and I'm saying, hey, the critical voice, I think that's it. Like, they don't have to buy into this concept. But to be curious about it. What if that thing they're saying to themselves or that comment that's kind of swimming around their head or swooping around them right now What if for a moment we pause and consider, what if that's not true, what that's saying to me? What if that's actually my critical voice talking to me? And just that pause, just that consideration, it shifts things in our consciousness. It loosens us up. What if that thing that I believe is true about me, or maybe I have believed it my whole life, what if that's not true? Who am I then? 
Well, and a lot of the critical voices that we might have aren't true, correct? I mean, it may have been put there by other people, even, you know, of childhoods that, you know, you had a critical parent or a critical teacher or friends that said really horrible things that stuck in there, correct? And you just replay them over and over and over because it's something that was programmed in. Does that make sense? Do I, that sounds yes. a little crazy, I guess. But. No, no, that's right on in my understanding that we absorb our environments. We're these little sponges that come on the planet and everybody's doing the best they can. But whatever was happening in that environment with those people, that's what we took into our consciousness, whether it was friends or parents or teachers or grandparents. And a lot of it was really loving and beautiful. And a lot of it was their critical voice structure that they had with themselves, Mm -hmm. that they inherited from the generations before them, that they inherited from the generations before them. So this is a human inheritance. Nobody's sitting around trying to cause each other pain. It's just what's been in the consciousness. Well, and the cool thing I think about acknowledging it and going, where does this thought come from? You know, mm-hmm. instead of just letting it play itself out, really acknowledging it, where does it come from? It might be kind of that story. Have you ever heard the story of the woman who, you know, she's making the pot roast and she cuts the end off? And her husband's like, why did you do that? And she didn't even know. It was just something her mom did. And then she had to, she went back to the mom. The mom's like, I'm not sure why, you know. (laughs) And it was like, finally they went back several generations. And it was because the grandmother's pot was too small. And so she had to cut the end off to be able to give it the roast. But they kept cutting the end off, not realizing that, you know, they didn't need to do that. Because they had the resources that maybe the grandmother didn't. That's a great example. You know, I think the thing that I always try to remember about this generational inheritance is that it may have fed in this painful cycle for us of a critical voice that we're going to heal now in our lives. But in all of that, in this inheritance that human beings have, it was full of love. People were really doing the best they could. And so there may be barriers to the direct love there may have been things that happened that were really bad but everyone truly did the best to their ability in that moment that there is so much love from generation to generation and then it does get obscured because we're humans on a journey on a planet where we're learning it's not a perfect planet there are a lot of wacky things that happen here But there's a lot of love. And so even in the critical voice, that healing, that's why I love it. Because what we discover is love. The thing that I love about what we're discussing is that you know, if we can acknowledge what's going on in our own soul, sometimes we are taking things out or we are reflecting those feelings out to other people. And mm-hmm. we may not even recognize it, but once we start to see it within ourselves, then our relationships can become better because we're, mm-hmm. we're able to express to our kids, I'm feeling frustrated because of, and we know why, instead mm-hmm. of just this horrible frustration that might be within us, Have you ever felt that way where you just have this Mm -hmm. negative feeling in you and you have no idea where it's even coming from? That's right. It's like old material in there we haven't digested yet. It hasn't come up to the light yet to be seen and understood. But we're all doing the best we can in each moment based on what we understand about ourselves. And I love how Maya Angelou always talked about if we knew better, we'd do better. Because that's what humans do. We learn and then we apply it and we grow and everybody gets blessed. But in the moment when there's that obscuration or that critical voice is running the show, it's because there's a belief there. That's all. It's not who anybody really is. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Hey, Firestarters, are you looking for a new way to listen to the Luminous Mind? Try listening on Stitcher. Haven't heard of Stitcher? Think of it as radio on demand. You can listen to the Luminous Mind anytime, anywhere. There is no downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. Just stream your favorite podcasts such as the Luminous Mind. 
Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and also from your favorite internet browser. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at Stitcher.com or in the App Store. And make sure you rate and review The Luminous Mind so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. and I think of the difficulties of it, I think sometimes it is that relationship. Like, Because many of us grew up outside of our homes. We were outside with other people more than we were with our families. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I feel like we've lost that ability to parent or to have children close nearby, you know, that we're so used to being with people of our same Mm -hmm. ages that sometimes the differences of just that, the differences of ages and the maturity Mm -hmm. levels and stuff might be difficult for us to handle. But Mm -hmm. being able to discover that within us, you know, maybe we can become more tolerant of ourselves and then that makes us tolerant of other people around us. Is that? It always starts inside. I, I completely agree. Whatever I learn how to do with myself, inside myself, all the different parts of myself, including those critical voice moments, that's what I can learn to do with all of the people in my world, especially my kids. So if I'm having a critical voice attack on myself and I'm unconscious about it, there's a really good chance I'm going to shoot it out at my kids because it's the same energy either going toward me or toward my kids. But if I have a process where I can start becoming curious and have some language and some tools about, wow, I think my critical voice is here right now, I'm not going to instantaneously shoot it out at someone in my environment. I've already stopped that cycle in its tracks, and there's something deeper that wants to arise, like my feelings or my awareness or being able to communicate what's going on for me, what I need. Well, and kind of give us some, and we talked about the tool of acknowledging that the Mm -hmm. critical voice is there, but then how can Mm -hmm. we, if we have those negative emotions, how can we take those and make them more loving where we can Mm -hmm. turn it around and be able to really harness that energy for good? Excellent question. So here's where we start talking a little bit about what it's like to be in relationship with ourself. And of course, There are all these different ways of understanding our inner sanctum and working with it. But what I find to be really effective in my own process and with my clients is to understand that the critical voice is in relationship to some smallness inside us, some part of us that feels small. You and I are grown women. We have families, we have activities, we have jobs, we can function, we can grocery shop and cook, but sometimes we feel small. Everybody feels small. Doesn't mean there's anything mentally ill about us. It just means sometimes we feel small. And what we realize is that smallness, that part of us, is what goes to the critical voice for some kind of support when it's afraid, when it's overwhelmed, when it doesn't know what to do. And this is all instantaneous and unconscious. So if I, first of all, imagine there's this concept of critical voice and I start just watching for it a little bit in a very neutral kind of way, what I recognize is there must be something happening inside me in that moment that's small. And I get curious about that. Now, depending on the tradition you look at or if you come from it from a more psychological perspective, you can call it the inner child call it the soul child it's very easy to talk about it it's a little part of me like I have a little Diana you have a little Rebecca so if my critical voice is giving me a really hard time and saying something to me specifically like you don't know how to homeschool your kids you know something really nasty go and write for it right and I 
step back and say, okay, hang on. I think there's a critical voice message here. <laughs> I believe the tone is here, right? I hear a should. I hear I'm deficient. I'm comparing myself with someone else. I'm hearing there's something wrong with me. So I've already established my critical voice is operating. And then, again, I'm approaching it very gently, very softly, almost like you would a feral cat. You know, you're not going in there really fast, just with a lot of sensitivity and attunement and inquiring into, wow, I wonder how I'm doing right now, this little small part of me. How is she feeling right now? Are there sensations in there for her? Is she tired? Is she hungry? Is she thirsty? Does she need some time alone? Does she need some time with people? Does she need some support? And I start having this relationship with the smallness. It's a beginning step. It's not ultimately who I really am, but it's part of this structure of consciousness that stops us. I was telling Diana before we, you know, when we first said hello, her voice is just super, I don't know if my audience is picking that up or not, but it's very calming <laughs> voice. Thank but you. I think, too, of what the words that you're saying, too, mm -hmm. it's very calming because I think we're our worst enemy. You know, we want to, I, I just love the way that you're approaching it because it's it does come from a place of actually loving yourself instead mm -hmm. of thinking that you're all of these horrible things that you're saying to yourself, you know, and I. I right. think of, you know, I'm looking at my 17 year old. I hear him saying a lot, like he's about to embark out into the world. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's expressing like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, if I've done everything that I could, which I'm thinking, I mean, he is a fantastic kid. So I'm like, you're mm -hmm. way better prepared than I am. But mm -hmm. when we can look at, I love the little thinking that you have that inside of you. You know, if you have mm -hmm. a teenage son and, and you can see that, I have that inside of me too. You know, I have Absolutely. a I have a little child in me that's going I I've never done cuz I've never been a parent, you know, I've never been yeah. I've never been married for 20 years before, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's different steps like that and I love the idea that we can let's acknowledge the fact that we have that scared child inside of us and that we should I guess I love the idea, too, of looking at the negative feeling. You express some words in there that I really loved, like... Um, like attunement, attunement and gentleness and approaching it so slowly. Yeah. You know, like you would a little child or an animal out in nature. Yeah. This is a part of us that it has gone underground because there's been a lot of lived experience of not connecting with us in this manner. So it's new. It's a new neural pathway. So we are approaching it with such gentleness and such slowness and just connecting. And it might even be just a, hello, I see you. That's a really big deal to connect with our smallness in that way. Yeah. I like to, I think I told you this last time, but when we're doing something new, it's like we're taking our pinky toenail and dipping just the teeniest part of it in a pond like it's so minuscule these ways of being different with ourselves, and yet it's a phenomenal shift in our consciousness when we begin it just a small teeny moment like that because we start to realize hey you know when I inquired into myself like that and I noticed my smallness my body got soft and I went up and had a cup of tea, or I went and read a magazine, or I took a little nap. Like, something got nicer inside me. <laughs> and then my whole day felt different. And if we want to do more than just that, which it's fine to just do that much, but some people are very tactile, kinesthetic learners. And you can take your left hand and just so gently put it over your heart center, just so lightly, without any pressure, just inquiring in with touch, as well as this kind of inner inquiry, how is my smallness in there? How am I doing in there? What do I need? What am I feeling? And this is just our privacy. We don't have to talk about this with anybody. We don't need to share this with our kids. It's just me being with me, maybe for five minutes, maybe for two minutes, 
it is a life-changing moment. When I think there's a lot of ways, um, we've discussed on our podcast before how body language actually affects the neural pathways of our own brain. You know, it's not only what we're projecting to other people, it's what we're telling ourselves through our body language. And so when somebody gives you a compliment, sometimes um, she said, Mm -hmm. you push it away. You know, you Mm -hmm. push that away. That's actually, that creates something in your brain of like, you're not accepting it. And Mm -hmm. so, like you said, when you can feel those feelings and kind of use that body language to accept yourself, it Mm -hmm. does create those neural pathways to a more positive thought process about yourself, correct? Oh, yes. I mean, I think it's this amazing journey that begins to unfold and blossom in its own way, at its own pace, in its own time. But it's all interconnected. If I start to include myself more, in my functioning, by just checking in with myself once in a while, that shifts not only how it feels to be in my body, how it feels to be with myself, but my ability to receive starts to open. If I don't know how to connect with these different parts inside of me, I'm not really available to receive deeply because All these parts want to be at the party. But if I don't have a relationship with them, I can't let the love that's outside of me trickle down and kind of rain on them gently because they're not a part of what I'm doing in this moment. Yeah. But if they start to be included, even in these very small ways, when some love comes toward me, I can let it just gently blow past me or rain upon me or whatever way it can come into my inner harbor safely and these different parts of me can enjoy that too that's true i was thinking of the picture that i was drawing in my brain was you know the difference between a clenched fist and an open fist and Mm -hmm. how a clenched fist it can't yeah it can't be hurt but at the same time it can't Mm -hmm. take in the positive love that you might get whereas if you have your hand open you know it's open to receiving and giving um, Mm -hmm. and not just taking i guess or that's a beautiful visual and i think the thing i would add to that is The clenched fist is also beautiful in its own way because it's existed that way for a long time as a way that we got to be here now. And it needed to be closed because of what it believed about reality. We can't force a clenched fist to open because that just feels like more pressurizing. But what we can start to do is make friends with the clenched fist and bring it close to us like we would the smallness. Like, wow, I notice that you're clenched right now and you're really strong. Like there's so much power in you and you must have needed to be clenched for a really good reason. And what we notice is the more we're with that clenched fist and we have relationship with it, it starts to, in its own way, soften and warm up and relax and maybe it starts opening just a teeny bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and before you know it it has opened by its own nature yeah it's kind of the difference between telling somebody to think positively and then allowing them to grow into that right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we model that for our children the more we learn how to do that with ourselves I think We're such great teachers for our children in so many ways, but I am the best teacher for my children when I am being this way with myself, and I don't even talk about it, but they notice how I am with myself, and the Sufi poet Rumi always talks about the pot boils what is in it. So if what I'm doing inside me is this, I will naturally begin to do this with the people I love. There's no difference. There's no separation. But if I'm really tight and my critical voice is being really hard on me, I'm not doing it intentionally, 
but my critical voice is going to spill out onto others. Mm -hmm. And then when I realize that, it's like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You feel even worse about yourself talking about the critical voice. (laughs) But you see, isn't that interesting that we have compassion that we're doing it with other people, but we don't realize, oh, my gosh, I've been doing that to me, too. Yeah. That hasn't felt very good for me or my little girl part or my little boy part. Yeah, if we treated other people the way we treat ourselves, we wouldn't have any friends. But yeah, and and then we wonder why we're struggling. We're having this inner turmoil type of thing. So. Well, I mean, the good news here is that more and more people have tools to learn this because there's so many phenomenal teachers on the planet right now. A particular school of work that is just brilliant at this is called the Work dot com. And Byron Katie is the teacher of this approach. And she's doing a lot of the same things we're talking about today, but in a really practical kind of four-question method. And there are many other teachers that are doing things to specifically help people kind of unravel what's underneath the judgment. So we don't have to stop at the judgment anymore the way perhaps generations before us people just said, well, there's a judgment and they believed it and then they went and milked the cow. The thing is, even those folks, they were doing the best they could to be kind to themselves. So humanity wants to heal. Humanity wants to discover who it really is. There's this optimizing thrust in us that is drawn towards the truth and drawn towards love. But this particular teaching The reason I love it is it can open it up so quick. Yeah, I was just listening to something or reading a book. I can't remember which it was. You know, the information goes out, but I don't I don't know where it comes in. I don't know where it's coming from. But but they were talking about that with our physical bodies, that our body really wants to be taking care of itself. And so it Mm. will adjust for the bad environment that we're in or Mm. the, you know, it's the same thing with our mind. If we let Mm. it, that sometimes it wants to heal itself, but we just need Mm. to give it the correct tools, correct? Mm. Or the, Mm. Uh, I agree with that. I think that we are so programmed to move towards wellness, to move towards joy, to move towards abundance And we get to try on these different tools. I think tools have to be fun. They have to be effective. They have to make us feel light. If we're going to slog through the mud, nobody's Mm going to do it, right? I mean, then it's just more critical voice. So if we have things we can practice that help us feel more alive, and our bodies are so patient, our minds are so patient, our souls are so resilient, As soon as we kind of get in line with the healing flow, things really shift and the body gets excited. It's like, ooh, ooh, let me show you this. And the mind's like, ooh, ooh, let me show you that. (laughs) They're so happy that we came to the party because they're just waiting for us to be there. Yeah. Well, in talking about tools, let's kind of talk about your healing rooms. We mentioned, of course, we're discussing critical voice and what's there, but maybe tell us some more of your healing rooms that's on your website and maybe resources and tools that you can find there to help us, you know, come to the party and have those resources. Yes, of course. I just want to say about the critical voice healing room that at the beginning of that room, I have a very long article that I wrote that summarizes a lot of what we're talking about today. So if anyone wants to get more specific support for the journey of healing the critical voice, if you go into that room, I've given so much gentle step-by-step understanding of what it means to have a critical voice, who has one, why we have them, what we can do to work with these other parts of who we are. And I have a lot of wonderful videos in there by phenomenal teachers from different traditions talking about how to get freedom from that. So that's my pitch for that room. (laughs) Uh, One of the cool things, I I just want to kind of cut in here for just a minute, but you know, when we're talking about the discovery of ourselves and, and we're really feeling like I'm feeling really 
really bad in this area, I think that's where your website is amazing because, I mean, the day that, you know, when we decided to do this Mm. and you sent me the link was obviously a day that I was listening to that Mm. critical voice. I went to that room Mm. and started, you know, reading through the stuff and listening to things. And I cannot tell you how it changed my outlook specifically for that day. And that's what I think we're talking about is that when we acknowledge it, all of a sudden we're going, because I've, I've seen myself do that. Like, okay, my brain is saying I need this. You know, I, I've somehow, you know, something's missing here. But that's the cool thing about her healing rooms is that at least that's how I'm picturing it, is that you can go there and if you acknowledge that you need something, that maybe you can find it there. Correct? That's what I wanted to offer. So I'm glad that it's feeling <laughs> specific for you in that way. I designed these initially because my clients and I will work on a particular area in their life, depending on what's going on. And maybe a person has a big opening in their inner experience about love. And they're just connecting so deeply with who they really are as love. But then a couple days later, they feel back in their old pattern. And they don't remember, how did I even get into that place that felt like love? So I made a room that's about love. And I've written about love and I've given support in the form of audios and videos. So when you go in that room, you get an energetic field that holds you in the flavor of love and their energetic transmissions that reconnect you to your deeper nature as love. If you're having a hard day with your critical voice, that's why the critical voice room is there. Not so you go in there and spend more time with your critical voice, (laughs) but so you can get that space and that movement and you start to remember that without the critical voice there's just space and even if people are having a hard time around me there's this buffer of space where I see what's happening with them but I don't take it personally and that's an amazing kind of freedom that's a phenomenal way to live if my critical voice isn't active or it doesn't get heated up by the other person's critical voice. I'm just hanging out with my true nature doing my day. Yeah. And that's, that's such a gift. That's one of the most amazing gifts of being on this <laughs> planet, just to hang out with who you really are. So I have a lot of rooms that are particular to qualities of our true nature that can get blocked. And then when we reconnect with them, We feel so whole. It's just the best feeling. So there's a joy room. There's a strength room. There's a room for compassion. I have another room that is probably my second favorite, which is reactions. And maybe someday we could talk about that as well. What happens to us when we go into a reaction? What happens to us when the other person's in a reaction? This is related to critical voice and it's kind of its own teaching as well. And I have other rooms that I think are helpful as places to go regularly if people wanted support with meditation or prayer or just getting still inside. There are a lot of resources there. Sometimes meditating can be very easy just to sit quietly and be still by ourselves. But if our critical voice is really loud, we don't really want to sit for five minutes and just listen to our critical voice. So (laughs) going into the meditation room, there are all of these things you can do to be accompanied while you want to sit and be still. Ways to help your mind get peaceful, ways to drop into your body in a gentle and loving way. So many rooms here, and I'm adding many more, It's such a happy thing for me to make these rooms. Well, I can imagine it would be a resource for yourself. I mean, Mm. at least when I'm working on my stuff, it's definitely helps me more probably than it does other people. But but, um, the resources are amazing. So I, I definitely feel both sides. Like I'm the one that the design is coming through from the divine and I also take my little girl in there and we play it so we have a great time exactly (laughs) 
great. Well, we will have to get together and talk about the reactionary thing because I can right. see how that definitely fits with a critical voice. But, yes. you know, before we say goodbye, I've spent a, almost a good hour with you already. But do you have any just final parting words on this particular topic? And then just give us your contact information again of how we can get in touch with you. Sure. No, that's my pleasure. I would say that even though it feels absolutely real and we believe it down to our toes, any judgment we have about ourselves or another person is not the deepest truth. There may be a nugget of truth in there that wants us to understand something, but all of the harshness and all of the suffering is just a layer over who we really are. Because who we really are is a reflection of this beautiful creation that we are manifesting all the time. And if we're far away from that, it just means there's something in the way to understand. And this teaching is a wonderful way to do that. That's great. It kind of reminds me, one of the therapists I went to one time said that, you know, if you have a cow pie, you know, yeah. and then you're trying to spread chocolate over the top of it, it's not going to make it any better. I mean, you've got to actually, you know, start from the foundation and not right. be trying to be spread. That's kind of like with positive thoughts. If we don't really dive in to where that's coming from, the positive thoughts is just the, the frosting on top of the cow pie. It's not that's really a helping. a funny you. story. <laughs> I, I like how Thich Nhat Hanh talks a lot about how the orchids grow out of this garbage. The orchids oh. grow out of this raw material that we don't see as valuable. And so, again, we don't have to slog through that raw material, but it's part of what gets converted. The human experience is here for a reason. The spiritual understanding, the spiritual resolution is what allows us to feel whole. But we can't skip over this human component because these two are in relationship on our human journey. Great family connectedness, too, but... And your contact information. So my website is dianazahir.com, D-I-A-N-A, -A, Z like zebra, A-H-E-E-R.com. Great. And I'll reiterate, her website is dianazahir.com, but we're going to be sure to link all of that up on our website, on her show notes page for this episode. But thank you so much for coming on with us and really talking about, you know, what we can do to help this critical voice. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I just wish for freedom for all of us, because that's why we're here is to enjoy our life and our families and education and this gift of life. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Diana Zahir, go to the show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, Go to the show notes at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 